of months ago, I talked about the Andretti family and how they are seemingly cursed at the Indianapolis 500. Other races, sure, they could probably win those, but the 500, that's the one that's eluded the family since 1969. I gave the stats between Michael, Marco, Mario, John and Jeff Andretti and they made for oof worthy reading because you can see how many times one of them was leading before an engine blew or they ended up in a wall and then it listed how many were mechanical retirements versus driver error retirements and it was always more mechanical than driver error or ending up in someone's accident which is pretty easy to do at 220 miles an hour. But teams as well can seemingly be cursed. All the cards just seem to fall against them. And this is what happened to the Simtech team through 1994 and 1995. And I appreciate I have done this one before, but it was done a very long time ago. And since then, things have improved. More information has come to light and other bits and pieces like that. As well as the production value on the original video, which has long been since lost to history, being very, very poor. You know, worse than now, if that's even possible. And while the team itself didn't roll onto an F1 grid until 1994, the actual company was set up in 1989 by Nick Worth and Max Mosley. Not a bad person to have in your corner setting up a company, given that Max was just four or so years from becoming the president of the FIA. But Simtech in itself is short for simulation technology, and was set up by Worth as the world was moving towards computers, and by being a pioneer in this space with big ideas, it should have turned things into a go-to place for all things racing. Worth had been at University College London studying engineering where he was friends with Mark Hurd, the son of Robin Hurd, who had set up the March team with Mosley way back when. Thanks to the contacts he had, after leaving UCL he joined the March team as an aerodynamicist, and by 1988 he was responsible for the aero concepts, schematics and design of wind tunnel components for the 1988 and 1989 March cars. He was also working on an active suspension system for the 1989 March car, so it wasn't just Lotus and Williams that were playing around with it, and while he worked at March, he was partnered with some bloke called Nui. So when he set about opening up Simtech, doing this when the Leighton House Company bought into March, making him and Mosley leave, he had intended it to be a more advanced version of the company he just left. In the early 1970s, a March chassis, a Cosworth DFE and a Hewland gearbox had been the plucky privateer starter pack. Simtech was going to use the new advances in computers and such to do things like wind tunnel construction, in addition to building chassis for different companies. One of those companies was Ligier, and the other was BMW. Well, might as well add the French government to that little list too because as we saw in a video the other week, Ligier and the French government were BFFs and the French government was giving Ligier every leg up it could. So much so that in the early 1990s, the government poured money into the area around Nevers and Manicourt to bring the circuit up to a more modern standard and encourage French motorsport engineering to be based there. Ligier moved to the circuit and Simtek very kindly built them a new wind tunnel, with the bill being picked up by the government or just being subsidised by the government. BMW meanwhile had been making moves to enter Formula 1 in the 1990s, but for whatever reason BMW decided that touring cars was more its thing and switched to the 3 Series that went to DTM in 1991. Simtek did build a couple of cars for them that never saw any racing action. That is, until 1992, when an Italian shoe salesman picked them up for a few quid and then later got kicked out of Formula 1 for bringing the sport into disrepute. Thankfully, Simtech's reputation was largely unsullied. Another team called Bravo came along at one point to have a car built for them, but that never happened either. So, Worth was sitting with these designs and these cars for people that never bought them after having them commissioned, which sounds like a common thing in the design industry from what I've heard. So he thought to himself, well... I've got all this stuff, why don't I build my own cars and use all of this as basically a massive advertisement for my company? Mosley was now president of the FIA and probably due to conflict of interest rules sold his shares in Simtech back to Worth. The shares were then sold to somebody else, Jack Brabham, and the team was launched in the August of 1993. Through this, Brabham was able to install his youngest son, an all-round nice bloke, David Brabham, as one of the drivers, and the team was carrying on that plucky privateer starter pack thing of slapping a Ford customer engine into the car. The engine in question was the customer Ford HB V8, so a down-on-power version of what Benetton was running in 1994. One thing also to note is that back in 1993, the entry fee for a new team was $500,000. That's not a mistake on my end, you know, regular viewers will know how bad I am with numbers, I've probably got dyslexia, but for numbers, dyscalculia, I think it's called, but either way, half a million, million to get into Formula One compared to the <laughs> telephone numbers that it is now. There was also a lot of pressure as well because you've got the son of a three-time champion in the car and also Worth was being held as the next best designer after Adrian Newey. 
But here comes the first card to fall the wrong way. Worth had started designing a car and was probably designing it as early as late 1992, but at the Canadian Grand Prix of 1993, Mosley had ordered the banning of all driver aids except flappy paddle gearboxes and power steering for 1994. So Simtech had to scrub what they'd already got and start again, as the car was originally designed to have an active suspension setup. The design that came after was too heavy to be used properly. Simtech also needed sponsors. They went after Andrea De Cesaris, who had a lot of money through Marlborough, but the deal never went through. De Cesaris instead took a couple of part-time deals with Jordan and Sauber through the course of 1994. The other driver they went after who had some money was the recently departed Gil de Ferran. I hope I've got that pronunciation correct. And he was racing for Paul Stewart Racing in F3000. Paul Stewart being the son of Jackie Stewart. And in 1992, he'd won the British Formula 3 Championship with Stewart. Deferrin had some decent backing with Sadia, or Sadia, which is a meatpacking company apparently, and had done a test in 1993 with footwork. Jos Verstappen was also testing at that time and he had impressed, but Gill's test day was marred by rain in the morning and then he busted his head open when he clanged his head on an open door of the motorhome, which meant he wasn't able to do as many laps as Verstappen did and ultimately get used to driving an F1 car. Ultimately, Gill took all of that money over to America and ended up becoming quite the respected driver on the American open wheel racing scene. So Simtech finally found a driver after a while of looking, the likeable Roland Ratzenberger, who was looking for his big break in motorsport. And with Ratzenberger being 33 and Brabham 27 when the season started, Worth was actually younger than his two drivers. The car was not how Worth had envisaged it being. It was heavy, way more conservative than he would have otherwise wanted, and had an underpowered engine mated to an H-pattern gearbox. The only thing they could realistically put themselves against was the Pacific team that had also joined the grid that year. Pacific was also an up-and-coming team that had little funding and had to rely on pay drivers to get them through the season, but Simtech had managed to secure a title sponsorship deal from MTV. MTV is a music channel. Well, was a music channel. Basically, they used to show music videos. It's a concept that's largely been killed off now because of things like YouTube, because if I want to watch the music video to Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses, I could just go and watch it on YouTube. I'd have to wait for it to come back round again late night on MTV, as it was back then. But either way, it was a good injection of money, and MTV Europe actually sent a TV team out to each race, so they could sort of document the whole journey of Simtech. It was probably their first foray into that whole reality TV thing, and it was all presented by young Davina McCall. The deficits that the Simtech car had were noticeable at the first round in Brazil. Brabham was able to drag his car to 26th and last on the grid while Ratzenberger failed to qualify along with one of the Pacifics. Brabham would then finish 12th and last on track. At the following round at Okayama, both cars would qualify but Brabham's electrics went and Roland would be 11th. But the Pacifics were being beaten and that was the main goal. Now the third round of the season was the San Marino Grand Prix, the qualifying session for which I've talked about before in a full dedicated video, so there's absolutely no point in me going into as much detail because, well, I've documented it all before. Obviously so much happened through that weekend that just doing a segment on its own would push the video out to be, what, 30 minutes or so. What happened is Roland went straight on at the Villeneuve kink, hitting the wall at about 190 miles an hour and came to a stop in the middle of Toza Corner. Roland was killed through a basal skull fracture, an injury that would claim the lives of several NASCAR drivers over the next few years, mandating the use of the hands device in NASCAR. The accident shook Simtech to the core, and Brabham chose to race and put on a very brave performance given the circumstances, and during that race the tragedy was compounded, because Senna would also suffer a fatal accident. Brabham lasted 27 laps before spinning off. A shout out does have to go to the Pacific team for the way they graciously handled the situation, because Barrichello couldn't start the race because he'd been injured in the Friday and obviously Roland having his fatal accident on the Saturday, the FIA actually offered the Pacific cars the final two grid slots, but the Pacific team said, no, we don't want them because we just weren't fast enough. So they basically just left the last two grid slots empty. At Monaco, both Simtech and Williams ran a single car before Andrea Montermini was drafted in to drive at the Spanish Grand Prix. The year was utterly cursed, as not only had there been two fatal accidents at the San Marino Grand Prix, Carl Wendlinger had been involved in a massive shunt at Monaco that put him in a coma, and then Andrea crashed at Barcelona and broke his ankle. The repair bills for Simtech were skyrocketing, so only Brabham's car made it to Canada where he finished 10th. That would be points today, but only the top six scored points back then. 
For the French Grand Prix onwards, though, Simtek finally had a driver that was bringing funds. Jean-Marc Gounon had been snapped up after being unavailable for the rounds up until this point due to other commitments. He immediately put on a good show, getting the car onto the grid with Brabham at the expense of the Pacifics and then going one better than Brabham did in Canada, getting the car into ninth at his home Grand Prix. But that's not to diminish Brabham at all because David was able to routinely get within striking distance of the LaRue's and Lotus cars and beat them and then went on to set the fastest lap in Japan and his only retirements that weren't mechanical were at Monaco and Portugal when he tangled with a lazy, although I can't find who was to blame for the accidents. He also rolled the car testing at Silverstone, but he had been running 9th at Hockenheim and 10th at Monza when the car died on him. But as is often the case with these teams, money is always the central issue. 14 million was the roundabout figure to stay on the grid around this time, and Simtek was constantly on the lookout for more cash, because MTV had said they were going to be scaling back their sponsorship for 1995. Towards the end of 1994, several teams were in trouble when it came to funds. LaRousse, Ligier, Lotus, Simtek and Minardi all having driver swaps at some point. Again, the driver roulette of late 1994 is something that I've covered in full on the channel, so I will spare you the dirty details, but I'll leave a card if I remember. If I don't, remind me in the comments. But either way, we're just going to concern ourselves with Simtek's driver roulette here. For the Japanese Grand Prix, Simtek ousted Gunon and replaced him with the pay driver's pay driver, Taki Inui. He did one race before being replaced for the final rounds by the Italian, Domenico Schiattarella. I tend to say Schiattarella because that's how Sterling Moss said it on the commentary for Grand Prix Manager 2. It's the same way I say Lancia, that's just the anglicised version of the name. I'm not putting on an Italian accent to say an Italian word. If anything, that's more offensive than just saying Lancia, but I digress. The saying was at the time that Japanese yen was better than francs and that Swiss francs were better than no francs. And actually, Pacific, even though they were underfunded and much slower than the Simtech team over the course of the year, managed to keep their same driver lineup for the entire season. Both Simtechs would retire from the final round in Adelaide. They would finish 13th out of the 14 teams ahead of Pacific and behind Lotus, with Lotus, Simtech and Pacific the only teams not to score a point all year. But things were to get a big knock. Brabham wanted to make the whole Simtech thing work and wanted to be committed to the project, but a factory drive with BMW in the 1995 British Touring Car Championship was too much of an offer to turn down. So he was out, and so was Sir Jack's backing. So once again, Simtech was on the lookout for another driver. They retained Schiattarella, who wasn't exactly Lance Stroll levels of loaded, but more of a cheap and cheerful option. He had enough, and it was consistent enough, to keep him around. So they had to find someone to occupy the other seat. Luckily, they got a lifeline from our old mates Flavio Brutori and Tom Walkinshaw. As mentioned in many videos by now, in the mid-1990s Flavio and Tom had hands in a lot of pies. Not just the fingers, they'd got their whole fists in there. Flavio and or Tom had interest in Ligier, Minardi, Arrows and Benetton at some point through the 90s, and the two had managed to acquire through the 1994 season the contracts of Johnny Herbert and Jos Verstappen and they needed somewhere to send Verstappen because Herbert was in the number two car at Benetton. Jos the boss was farmed out to Simtech in 1995 for development because Flavio felt that Jos was too error prone. In addition to Verstappen, Flavio sorted Simtech out with the Ford ED engine, which was better than the HB, but still not amazing. And he also gave the team the semi-auto flappy paddle gearboxes they'd run through 1994. The plan for Simtech was to use Schiattarella for the first half of the season and then take on Hideki Noda for the second half. And there probably is an opening there to do a video on the Japanese pay drivers of the 1990s, but when it came to getting out on track, the 1995 Simtech was leaps and bounds better than what Brabham & Co had the previous year. Not only were they faster than the Pacific cars, but they were also faster than the Brazilian national team, 40. And while Brabham in 1994 was able to mix it with LaRue's and Lotus, Verstappen was able to take the improved Simtech of 1995 a stage further. He was mixing it with Ligier, Minardi, Sauber, Footwork, Tyrrell, the mid-grid teams of the time, well maybe not Minardi, but still mix it with the mid-grid teams, on merit. And he said that the car was actually pretty easy to drive. But the car would retire from the Brazilian Grand Prix. Well, both of them did. At the next round in Argentina, the performance at Brazil wasn't just a one-off because Verstappen was 14th on the grid and was then battling at one point with Burgess Ferrari inside the points until the pit stops. There, Simtech got found out. They didn't have a lot of the stuff the other teams had to facilitate a fast tyre change and he lost 25 seconds in the pit stop before the gearbox let go on the very next lap. Two races in and the car had done a total of 39 racing laps, 16 in Brazil, 23 in Argentina. 
both of the retirements being gearbox related. Another double retirement came in San Marino, again Verstappen hampered with gearbox issues and then they were 15th and 12th in Barcelona. By the time they got to Monaco, the situation was dire. Simtek was around 6 million in debt at this point. Verstappen didn't even start the race because of, once again, gearbox issues. Simtek had signed a deal with a potential backer, but the deal had to be cancelled because of an earthquake in the backer's home country of Japan. There was also something to do with bogus bank transfers, but I can't find anything else about that. The sponsors that were currently with the team, so MTV, Korean Air and Russell Athletic, said that if things came to it, they would increase the sponsorship, but it wasn't going to be enough. On top of this, Hideki Noda had paid his deposit to race for the final seven rounds of the season, but a lot of his sponsors had been affected by that same earthquake in Kobe. They'd missed the Canadian Grand Prix, and then just before the French Grand Prix, the team was put into administration. Not only did the Formula 1 team go under, but also the parent company went under with the loss of around 48 jobs. 35 of those were the Formula 1 crew. And actually, Simtech had by far the smallest crew of any of the teams. They had 10% of what Ferrari was taking. 35 people. That's... Well, that's nothing in modern Formula 1, given how many people are around the car just to change the wheels now. Following the demise of Simtech, Worth got a job at Benetton as a chief designer, beginning his time there in 1996 and left in 1999. In 2003, he founded Worth Research, which did a couple of contracts for the FIA, including the proposed split rear wing design that they wanted to have in 2008. He then got involved with the Acura LMP program in the American Le Mans series, designing Acura's LMP1 entry. Then, in 2009, the company teamed up with Man & Motorsport to design the 2010 Virgin Racing entry, being the first car in F1 history to be designed entirely using computational fluid dynamics and foregoing any wind tunnel testing. It seems that he's had quite the career in robotics since leaving Formula 1. His time at Benetton came when the team was falling off, so it makes you wonder what he'd been able to do if he'd been given a blank check. After the Simtech team folded, he was invited to talk with the big boys of F1 like Ferrari, but chose to stay in England. The factory is still standing in Banbury as well. Unit 8 of the Acres estate in Banbury that Simtech occupied has, at the time of writing, got new tenants. Pick Pack Dispatch, apparently, although that's based off a of Google Street View from 2022. So through doing some research, it's either them or some nutrition company. But Simtech is the case of a team coming in with good intentions, willing to try and push the boundaries of what is possible as Formula 1 advances into this new computer era, only for the cars to just completely fall against them. So it makes you wonder what would have happened if they had a bit more luck, if the earthquake hadn't happened in Japan for instance, and they'd got the funding that they needed to survive 1995. Would they have survived into 1996, and then onwards into 97, 98, even the turn of the new millennium? That's one for you to discuss in the comments. So then, a look at the Simtech team that seemed to have things go against them at the most inopportune times. If this has been a nice revisit of a long forgotten topic, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on any future content. Massive thanks as always to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support. And if you want to help keep the picture purchasing piggy bank topped up, a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces. Well, the super thanks if you're just into the one and done type of stuff. So until next time, I've been Aiden Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.